We certainly appreciate the uh, opportunity to be here. Uh, like others have said, we'd love to be in the field. Uh, I was able to bring a little bit of field to you. Uh, there's plants outside. Uh, take a look at those. I also have a little bit of field bobbing on my rubber boots and my truck still. So uh, it was a little bit muddy going out there yesterday. Um, I'd like to, I'm going to ask Jacob here uh, to kind of go over our breeding program and how he uh, approaches water use efficiency uh, for about 10 minutes. And I'll spend about 20 minutes really showing you how we use all this irrigation response data uh, to properly place, you know, to provide to our, our sales reps, to provide to our retailers, so that when you're asking for a variety that, you know, our first question is going to be, what kind of water do you have? And we want to properly place those varieties on, uh, on each field scenario with regard to water. Before we get started, I want to make sure and introduce all the, the Dow Agri Sciences folks that are with us today. In the back, Cassidy Click is our, uh, our seed sales rep. Uh, we have Haley Neighbors, who you'll uh, see a little bit later in the program with the uh, spray drift demonstration out in the lobby. Uh, she's in our enlist field specialist. Uh, we have Katie Verrett, who's our crop protection sales rep here. Uh, we also have uh, Ben Benton. There he is in the back there. He's my, my counterpart north of Swisher County, so I'll go up to, to Swisher. And then uh, I think we've got everybody covered. Did I miss anybody? That's it. And of course, we got Jacob here. So I'm going to ask Jacob to uh, uh, provide you that overview of our breeding program. All right, thank you all again. I appreciate the, the opportunity to be here. Uh, we had to switch gears a little bit. Uh, well, I was going to talk a few of the experimental varieties and how we incorporate uh, our water use efficiency trials into it. But uh, like I said, switch gears. So we'll talk a little bit about our breeding program, the Fidegen Texas High Plains Breeding Program. So we have a mission statement. Uh, and for us, personally, it's, it's very personal for our team. Uh, and that is to develop and design the best cotton varieties for the West Texas farmer uh, that combine high yielding and high quality varieties uh, with our robust native trade program and our cutting, her cutting edge herbicide technologies. Um, and we probably won't get into too much detail with this. Our lawyers get a little bit nervous when uh, we get the microphone sometimes. So uh, as we're going through this, uh, that is our breeding objective, objectives that we have for the High Plains, we only, our unit only focuses on the High Plains. Uh, our territory moves from the top of Texas down to the Concho Valley. So in that, we're looking at our high yielding varieties, high, maintaining the quality, uh, and specific to today's topics, uh, our water use efficiency uh, trials that we run uh, across the High Plains. And, and uh, other territories can really elaborate on that a little bit further for us. Uh, getting, getting all that bundled up into uh, varieties that are mature, have the maturity for the high plains, uh, top to bottom, with adaptive plant types. I know a lot of people have uh, tried some phytogen and uh, have had a few issues, and that's what our team is to, here to do, is to correct, fix those issues that we've got with it. Increase our vert wilt, wilt, vertical and wilt tolerance. Uh, we also have, like I mentioned, with our native trait program, uh, and Corey, uh, just all the all the companies are working towards this. So we have uh, the root not nematode native trait program, uh, as well as the reniform. Uh, we're working with back to a blight native traits uh, from multiple backgrounds, as well as bundling that with the new herbicide <coughs> technologies that we're looking to deploy on the high plains. So that's the objectives and how we're how we're going to go about doing that. Well. Like I mentioned earlier, our territory that the Te High Plains Breeding Program runs is from the top of Texas down to the Concho Valley, and we do have some responsibilities in, in the Kansas now. So we are running some uh, contract trials up there in the Kansas area. Um, we also run a number of locations on farm trials with growers uh, under realistic growing conditions. Uh, we, we don't ask them to do anything special out of, uh, <coughs> out of our needs. We just let them run it. Uh, their irrigations, their capacities, and then we get that real-time data uh, and our performance based off of their land and their production practices. Uh, we also have university partnerships. Uh, we work with Texas Tech, Texas A&M, uh, whether that be with water use efficiency trials or with uh, spinning trials or uh, a number of different things that we're working, pathology work. Uh, we have 
partnerships throughout the whole programs with the Extension, A&M, and Texas Tech University. Uh, we do utilize and leverage our Dow Indianapolis Labs uh, through our market programs, uh, as well as leveraging the herbicide technologies, um, as well as working, we have a close working relationship with our regional agronomists. Uh, we are, there aren't very many of us out here with Phytogen R&D, uh, so we work together in a partnership to accomplish these goals. Uh, well, my team, we did a lot of responsibilities. Ken and, and Ben are taking over some of the other responsibilities and we're putting together and work as a cohesive unit. So for Phytogen, we, we, we really enjoy that uh, uh, partnership. And those agronomists, and we're out in the fields too, so they provide us with uh, you know, how, how these lines are performing agronomically, water use efficiency, and grower feedback and trends that we're seeing in the field, whether that be you know, uh, insect pressure, disease pressure, or anything else that we're seeing coming up or flaring up within our territories. So in a, in a really short time, uh, we've, we've, our unit has been uh, fairly productive. Uh, we have enjoyed uh, our other breeding stations uh, that we have in California and Leland, Mississippi and Indianapolis. Uh, they help us out with uh, so far getting us up and running. So we did produce, we are able to produce some lines in a relatively short time. Uh, we've had our boots on the ground since uh, 2011. Uh, we've been actively <coughs> breeding in, in the high plains since 2009. But uh, as for program development, uh, we have been able to release a few varieties uh, from this program and typically what you'll see from a uh, high plains variety released by the phytogen unit you'll see a 200 number on it uh, so we have uh, phytogen 222 that was one of our varieties that we tested at least for this program and then new for this year uh, 223 243 and 308 um, those are varieties that fast track through our program that actually had our fingerprints really on those varieties. We're very proud of those varieties. And again, you see uh, 417 with the nematode tolerance, the new enlist lines, and we're slated to release uh, two new varieties for uh, 2017, an, an early season enlist bearing variety and an early to mid type of variety that has the enlist technology. So just to kind of talk about a little bit about our breeding program. So the area within the circle is the area that we are traveling in and planting grower locations out in and uh, having contract trials. So we, like I said, we are moving from the top of Texas down to the lower Concho Valley. Uh, it, it keeps us on our, on our toes with our unit. Um, and we also wanted to talk about the breeding program because, you know, not many people see us out there, and we do have, we actually have a breeding program going on in West Texas. Uh, it took uh, Phytogen a little bit of time to get there, but uh, get to West Texas, but we have a very conservative model <coughs> where we establish, grow, and then move on. So we started in uh, California, San Joaquin Valley, uh, grew, developed, succeeded, and moved to Leland, Mississippi. Uh, then, you know, when in our Leland, they produced the same model, they established, Gained success, and then we branched out to Texas. So a little bit backwards into the that. I ought to come to Texas first, but that's just me. I'm from here. But uh, so the conservative model has served us well. We operate light, lean, and fast. And you know a lot of that is dictated because we have uh, two boards, and 49% of our of our company is still owned by a farming unit. So the, as them being very conservative, they kind of lead us to in that direction to stay, play, play all of our cards close to our chest and keep everything lean and tight. So again, it's easier to talk about cotton varieties when you're standing in front of them, but today we're running a little bit lean on cotton. So with that, I'll hand it over to Ken. Thanks, Jacob. Uh, in the next few minutes, uh, I want to kind of go over how we use these irrigation response trials and, uh, and hopefully deliver some information that's, that's usable. Uh, for, for you the grower and you the consultant. Uh, so what's the objective of these trials? You know, basically, we could do the same thing, keeping track of uh, the amount of water that each one of these strip trials that all of us put in that you've seen as you drive around. We could track that, but it would take a long time to figure out, and you have a lot of confounding factors, all different kind of soil types, 
So to be able to look at a set of varieties and screen the, this germplasm as we're developing this under pretty close scrutiny and, and tight uh, experimental conditions like what Bob had described earlier, uh, we can do that in a shorter time span and get a more, more confident answer out, out of that information too. So but how we're using it is, is screening all the germplasm for water response hopefully before you ever see it in your field to where we can provide that answer to you straight from the get-go. Uh, of course, we're looking at link yield, but the other thing important for y'all sitting in this room is micronair. I mean, it's unusual to see that high micronair that Tim showed earlier. Usually you're fighting that low micronair, particularly as you add more water. Uh, so that, that's a uh, primary driver for, for the overall crop value in this part of the world. Uh, again, you know, if we didn't have these things, you know, Jacob would have a a set of germplasm for three or four years. Uh, ben and I would get it for one or two seasons and then we finally figure out, well, oh, this one doesn't do well under moderate water. Well, that'd been nice to know before we put it in your hands, you know? So that's kind of the, the, the whole goal is a small number of these tightly controlled uh, irrigation response trials can provide that answer before we ever get that new variety in your hands. And, and you know, take all that risk out of the grower's hands uh, instead of putting this in your hands and figuring it out it doesn't work. Uh, you know, staple and strength, we look at that, but those are sort of highly heritable, and I'm going to show you some trend lines here uh, in a minute, but they're a lot more predictable than water responsiveness, but I had been surprised at, at some of the uh, strength stability out of some of these varieties that, that Jacob had mentioned before. And we'll look at that briefly. I, I'm not going to go through each one of these. Uh, locations. Uh, so this year in our irrigation response trials we have 24 to 28 varieties at each location. Uh, three or four of those are either our WRF checks or a competitor variety at each, each location. But the bulk of it is our new Wash Strike 3 Flex Enlist varieties. Uh, that, that will be either be coming out this upcoming season or things that are be coming out in 2018. So this is the stuff obviously, you know, all of the Dow folks in the room are, are highly excited about. Uh, this year we have five locations. Last year we only had four, all four in the High Plains. You'll recognize those. Uh, four are still in the High Plains this year, but I added a, one in the Rolling Plains uh, to this year primarily to, uh, to give some folks in Oklahoma a little bit of information about water response uh, in their part of the world. Uh, at, at each site, we do have four irrigation regimes, similar to what uh, Bob had, had described earlier. You know, this is kind of Bob's uh, strategy here, have a rain fed 36 to 90. Uh, you know, we also work with Dr. Keeling, and, uh, and of course, Jim Bordowski back there has a base, and then a 1.5 base and a, and a .5 base. And, and to be honest, Bob, you and Jim, uh, you know, you're, you're the guys that are sitting there white knuckled every time it rains trying to figure out what to do. You know, I, I've told y'all before, I don't really care what the regimes are. I just want a, a range of response at the end of the day because I'm tying this stuff over uh, all these locations. Uh, so, you know, how you get there is immaterial to me. I trust you to do uh, the great jobs y'all do. I just want a nice range of response uh, to know how these varieties reacted in each one of these situations. But, but I'm glad you're, you're the detailed guy on, on the irrigation regime. Uh, most of them begin either during spring or, or to early bloom. Uh, some initial irrigation are, are applied to the rain feds, as Bob mentioned earlier. We want some good quality data. We'll make sure the stands are there. Uh, in other words, if we have uh, drought stress at, uh, you know, at six true leaf, well, what does that really tell us? Uh, not a whole lot in terms of yield and fiber quality response. So we collect a lot of data, and I won't go over all that. Uh, this is where they're located. You'll recognize it's the same places, right, that Tim showed earlier, right? Uh, so here's Bob's here in northern Hale County. Actually, I think part of my trial is in Swisher, right on the line there. And then uh, Dr. Keeling has the location for us at Halfway and down at the Mesa that Ag Cares. Uh, we have a location uh, at the Quaker uh, Farm, Texas Tech Quaker Farm, uh, that really Jacob uh, works with the, the Texas Tech folks. To, uh, to establish that location. And then the new location I've established this year on, on the Rolling Plains is over at Chillicothe. Uh, the Quaker Farm and the Chillicothe locations are all are both drip, and the other three are, are LEPA systems. Uh, Dr. Emmy Kamira uh, and Jonathan Ramirez out at that station are running that. Uh, and sorry, Tim, I took up all the drip space over there, so I got their total capacity on, on the irrigation response areas. 
Uh, but th this ought to give us a, a good idea. Uh, you know, we'd love to have one up here somewhere, but you know, the reason you're seeing the same locations is there's very limited places that can conduct this type of research. You know, the, the kind of system that Bob uh, described to you earlier doesn't exist in a lot of places. So this is pretty much it as far as where we can do this type of research. So it's pretty important to us. So Bob's trial, what, what you would have seen if you'd have been out there, uh, the one that, that uh, and Bob, I think when you're showing that um, the infrared image, ours was the one at the very top of, of where he was pointing. Uh, it's planted May 24th. Uh, from April 1st to uh, the planting, had about an inch and a half, into six tenths or so. Rainfall since planting has been uh, about 5.7 inches. So it was a lot of preloaded. Uh, you know, there really wasn't a lot of irrigation until, what, um, early square so. Uh, irrigation for each one of these regimes, and Bob, I just kind of piled in the, the stuff that was the same and, and stuff that differed by, by irrigation regime. You can see uh, how much the irrigation differences are, about an inch difference between rain fed and 30%, and then in what another almost two and a half inch difference uh, between that and 60, and then a two inch difference between 60 and 90. Then you, this is uh, all the water, so irrigation plus rainfall, you can see the differences there. So I went out and uh, donned my rubber boots yesterday and uh, uh, got about halfway out in the field and I was talking to John who works for Bob and I saw his footprints because he took those same pictures as yesterday when I was out there and I was following his and uh, I got about halfway through there and began thinking, was this really a good idea? Because uh, I was, I was you know, about 25 pounds heavier and dirt everywhere, but it, nonetheless I got some pictures. And, and, and kind of the same approach, and Bob, did, Bob and I didn't even compare notes, but we kind of came off the same direction here. Kind of a more determinate uh, early season variety versus a mid-season more indeterminate variety. And look at them in, in each regime. So this is the rain-fed regime, and this is a, uh, a yardstick out there just so you can kind of get a, a rough estimate. And I've, I've kind of estimated what the, the canopy heights here were about 24 inches for this uh, determinate variety and about 27 inches for the uh, indeterminate. Um, as you add some water, uh, you can see the canopy starting to, to fill in a little bit better. Add a couple of inches there, add a couple of inches on, on both of them. Uh, then really 60 is where you really start to see the big jump in, in, uh, in canopy and, and of course bow load as well. Uh, so you get a little bit taller plants, and, and there's a pretty good load on that 60%. Uh, I probably didn't represent the plants that I picked and, and had displayed for you outside. Uh, probably the 60 and 90 look closer than what those plants did pick, but uh, uh, there are some differences between that and the, and the 90%. Uh, and of course, you know, the 60 and 90 had just been, been irrigated, uh, what, last Friday, I believe it was, so, uh, so that they're really, really wet right now. So here's the plants that are, that are outside here. Uh, kind of gave you some kind of rough estimate. Uh, can you guess what that hot period in July did to that rain fed? You know, so all those bowls there essentially were set in August. Uh, so you can see the effects of, of that dry and, and hot weather uh, back in July. Here's as you add another uh, couple of, another inch or so to the, the equation. It's amazing what an inch of water at the right time does. And then here's another two and a half. This is probably the, the regime that I didn't pick the right plant to represent it real well. Probably should look a little bit more like a 90% ET plant. But it gives you a rough idea about what you would have seen had, had we been, out, been able to get out there today. <clears throat> so what is water use efficiency? You know, we, we talk a lot about it, and, but nobody seems to know. Uh, it, when it gets down to it, it's pounds of lint per acre per inch of water. And when you really get down to it, it's really about that dollars per inch of water. Uh, and of course we can argue all day about what the pumping costs, but it costs money whenever you're pumping that acre or inch of water out there. So you want to get your bang for your buck and not every variety is going to respond to that additional inch of water. Right? I think we've seen that this morning. So, you know, here's the real world usage of water use efficiency. This is how we're getting information for our sales reps, for our retailers, to bring to you, the grower, and, and you, the consultant, uh, to properly place these varieties on how they respond to each, each uh, of these irrigation regimes. So this is uh, total water here on the bottom. 
and this is in this case Lake Eel. This is all four of the locations that we had last year, uh, and I've just chosen some varieties here. The blue line is Fibermax 2484, is kind of our standard check, like Tim said earlier. Uh, and these are, are some of the new varieties that, uh, that Jacob mentioned before. The red line is Phy uh, Phytogen 223. The green is Phytogen 243. The purple is Phytogen 308. And then the orange line there is Phytogen 333. And how they responded lake yield wise across that water spectrum. So, you know, when, when we look at this, uh, immediately you see, okay, well, 333 and 243 tended to yield well no matter what irrigation regime it was put under. So, and, and you know, I tell all sales reps, you know, our go everywhere cottons this year were 243 and 333 because of this data right here. So we have some, some actual data to back that up. So, you know, that kind of, it, it responded, both of those varieties responded very well uh, to no matter what situation, whether it had light water, moderate water, or really good water uh, that it was grown under. Uh, this purple line right here, you see kind of flattens off. So, you know, if you got somebody that has, uh, you know, six or seven gallons per minute per acre over here, we're probably not going to recommend Phytogen 308 because it doesn't respond as well as something like 333 or 243 on that upper end of the spectrum. So, but it does respond well on that lower end of the spectrum. So, again, that's kind of an example where, you know, proper placement makes all the, the difference in the world because somebody with that kind of good water capacity and they grow in 308, are likely to be disappointed, and they should have grown 333 or 243, and they've been much happier and more successful. So the crop value response, of course, taking into account all the, the HVI uh, data, kind of follows the same trend, uh, but you see much the same thing. You know, some of these varieties flatten off, while others respond very well in the upper end of water. So to look at some of these, these uh, HVI characteristics, uh, some of these varieties, honestly, Jacob kind of surprised me. Uh, I think Jacob even learned a lot about these new varieties from these trials as well. You know, you'd expect the more water you pump into the system, you'd expect a longer fire. Because that's, you know, during the first three weeks after, after bloom is when fiber length is set. As long as you get some good water, you ought to stretch out that, that fiber cell, right? Uh, one thing that surprised me about a couple of these, particularly, is uh, Phytogen 223. You remember 223 on that first slide I showed responded better on that lower end of the water spectrum. So dry land, light water, it started to tail off when you got to about moderate water uh, levels. But on the where, so where it's fit on on length yield, uh, look at the, the length stability that we saw 223. So you know, picture getting a uh, uh, a, a crop of 223 that responds well in dry land and light water, and you're able to, to get that difference of, of fiber length versus these others. Uh, so it's kind of a win-win. Good to know this stuff before we recommend it to you. Yep, okay. Micronair, I, I said earlier to, to me that you know, lake yield and micronair drive everything in this part of the world in terms of, of crop value. Obviously, lake yield is important. Micronair can and you can really counteract everything you work for to put that extra pound on there. So when Bob was talking about that 90%, sometimes you see that, that uh, response kind of dip back over. I think one of those experimentals that you showed showed just that, that when you had too much water, it went the other way. Uh, so, but you could conceivably have a variety that still responded lake yield wise so that, you know, the more water you pump out there, it's still going to produce a lot of lake yield, but it may be diving on your on your micronair and everything you work for is now 10, 15 cent deduct. So, you know, what good is that? You just wasted all that money trying to produce more pounds and lost it on the micronair. So it, it's, it's really good to, to see this. And of course, you know, as you would expect, the more water you pump into the system, uh, the lower the micronair, uh, because you had that higher proportion of immature fiber on those, those younger bowls. Uh, and of course, you, you see varied response they pretty much all respond the same way. Uh, last year, at least, all of them at least stayed out of that discount range. Uh, of course, it's important to try to remain in that green range right there, which is a premium range. Fiber strength, highly heritable. But again, Jacob, I was kind of surprised at a couple of these new varieties and how uh, strength stable they were. So in other words, similar strength regardless of what 
uh, irrigation scenario you put it on. So generally you expect that the more water you pour into the system, the higher the strength, but sometimes the variety response is, is similar. I was surprised on things like hydrogen 308, which is known for high strength, almost a Kayla strength, but even achieved that 33.8 to 34 gram per text, even on that lower end of the water spectrum. Again, good to know before you plant that variety, if you're looking for some strength, uh, or, or you know, kind of figure that into the equation, right? So again, on loan value, you kind of expect it to go down as you pump water into the system. Some of them take a nosedive quicker, others of them are more stable like 308 here in this example. Uh, pretty much had the same loan value no matter what uh, water regime you, you placed it under. Again, important to know before you, you plant 160 acres of this stuff. So the folks at Indianapolis are probably fire me today if you even know I'm showing this to you. But then, the good part is you can't read it anyway because it's so small. But this is you know, kind of a, 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 an example of how we're putting this data to use. Uh, you know, Last year uh, I kind of categorized each variety on their response to, uh, based on the irrigation response data that we had. Put it on a little cheat sheet that didn't go through lawyers so it was actually useful. And gave it to our sales reps to distribute to retailers. I gave it to the consultants. You know, basically said, you know, this variety is good under dry land to moderate. This one's broadly adapted. Uh, you know, this one's only good on the high end of water. Those sorts of comments. Uh, so this year, you know, and, and I like all of Bob's. I call them Bobisms. You know, all these little sayings that Bob flashes up here. Uh, you know, it was an undeniable truth. I think you, you use sometimes. Uh, one of my undeniable truths is, uh, if you don't ask, if, if, if you don't ask the question, the answer is always no. So I asked our lawyers, well, you know, this is the kind of stuff we. This is the first question when our sales reps are asked, what variety? You know, I'm interested in, in growing some phytogen. We heard it comes up like gangbusters. Which variety do I need? And what's the first question the Kansas City Clicks going to ask? What kind of water do you have? So, boy, wouldn't it be nice to have that on the, the variety guide, the little trifold things that we hand out at meetings? Uh, so this year we're actually going to have that. So first seed company I've ever worked for that we're actually going to have that. And that's all because we had data to back it up. It wasn't just gut feeling. It wasn't just, well, you know, it did well at such and such circle. And, you know, it wasn't anecdotal data. It was empirical data done by the right folks in the right way. And... Uh, our legal team says, yes, sounds good. You got data to back it up, put it on there. So we'll be the first company that I know of to actually have that column listed on our variety guide so that when you get that variety guide, you'll, you'll know immediately where our data says that variety does best in terms of water response. So in terms of, of the varieties I would have shown you had we been able to go out there today, the ones I would have highlighted, of course, there's our new Phytogen 490, White Strike 3 Flex and List. Uh, we had a strategic launch this year uh, across uh, West Texas and really across the belt. Uh, we're going to have excellent supply in 2017. Uh, of course, you know, our Enlist trait allows to go over top with Enlist Duo, which we're still waiting on the, on the label to get approved, uh, as well as Glufosinate, and of course Roundup over the top as well. And of course it has our, our White Strike 3 um, three gene package for, uh, for BT, for Lepidopterous Control. Uh, another one you would have seen out there is our 200 series. We haven't named it yet, uh, but we're getting close. Uh, it is an early season, and of course, if you, you look at our phytogen lineup, 200s are very early to earlies, 300s are early to early mids, 4s are mids, 5s, which you don't see in this part of the world, are, are full season. Uh, so this 200 series is an early maturity developed by, by Jacob here. Uh, we'll have pretty good inter introductory supplies for 2017. And the reason I say pretty good is it's all ours. So it's either going to my district or it's going to Ben's district. So the little bit of seed that we have is, is in a concentrated area. Uh, same goes for this 300 series here that's yet to be named, but uh, a little hint it may actually be 300. Uh, it's an early mid. Uh, again, introductory supply, this particular line last year showed that it belongs right here in West Texas. So lucky for us. So again, uh, the supply is, is only split between Ben and myself. 
a little bit south of us. Uh, nobody else in the belt gets it, so it's, it's all ours. Uh, so we'll have pretty significant quantities of these two, and of course, uh, as much as you want to plant of that one. Uh, but there's in that trial that, that Bob and, and Wayne and others have this year, numerous lines that's, that Jacob's developed. That those are the ones we're really excited about. I mean, th these are, are good lines. Don't get me wrong, but the stuff that, that we're watering our mouths over is that stuff that's released in 2018. He has a whole. Um, series of, of experimentals that those are the ones we think are, are really going to take the next uh, next step into length yield and fiber quality in a, in a white strike three flexing list. So you know to summarize you know to understand how uh, plants use water and how to the best uh, you know properly place these varieties you got to understand how uh, how the soil plant and atmosphere all work together and affect water use efficiency. And hopefully that's what we're doing with these irrigation response trial data uh, to know what the irrigation needs and cost effectiveness of each one of these varieties that we're bringing out before you take a risk and plant, you know, 500 bags of this stuff. It, it behooves us to provide that information to you before you take that risk. Uh, so that, that's key and then that's what that drives uh, the, the incredible investment we've made in these, in these irrigation response trials. So we, we hope that was some good information for you. Uh, if you do have a chance to go by the trial next week, certainly uh, come by. But we do want to also, there's some cards by our booth in, in the back there. We're having a, um, a uh, field day next week on September the 8th. That's uh, Thursday next week. Starts at the experiment station there in Lubbock, just north of the uh, Lubbock Airport. We're going to look at everything in this duo. So Haley's got a a trial with Wayne Keeling, uh, looking at uh, weed control and all, all aspects of tank contamination, tank clean out, uh, all these different aspects of the list duo. We'll go over that in, in detail, and then there's a uh, nice uh, large plot on farm innovation trial nearby that we'll look at as well. Uh, so you should have all your your questions answered regarding you know how this new enlist germplasm look and how's it going to perform, and in every question that you want. Uh, answered about in this duo herbicide uh, will be addressed and again September the 8th. There's a morning session and there's an afternoon session. You can choose which one. They're identical and I would love to have you there. With that, for, for any questions, I'd love to take them. Well, thank y'all. Appreciate it.